Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this event. This morning, I'm going to be discussing rotator cuff tears that cannot be fixed and the treatment options that are available to us for this complicated problem. The rotator cuff is comprised of four muscles that originate on the shoulder blade and make their way out to their attachment site behind the ball of the ball and socket joint. And as they make their way out to the joint, they fuse to form the single rotator cuff tendon. The rotator cuff is responsible for moving the arm in space. It helps to elevate the arm and to abduct the arm away from the body. It also helps us to rotate externally and internally. But even more important than its job in moving the arm in space is its job in maintaining balance and stability of the joint. Like most other joints in the body, some of the stability is derived from the shape of the bones and the way they fit together like puzzle pieces, as well as the short and stout ligaments that connect one bone to another bone. But the elbow joint, for example, derives most of its stability from the bones, whereas the shoulder joint is relatively unstable. It's a very large ball uh, that meets up with a very small and shallow dish. So it's relatively unstable by design based on the bony anatomy alone, and therefore requires the rotator cuff muscles to confer additional balance and stability to the joint. These muscles work in force couples. They work in pairs to provide a stable connection between ball and socket so that the arm can move like a hinge the way that other joints do. When there's a very large rotator cuff tear, when the rotator cuff is deficient, you lose this stable connection. And therefore, when the arm tries to move, instead of opening like a hinge, you'll find that some of these patients will simply shrug their shoulder and they lose the ability to move the arm in space, which can be significantly debilitating. These rotator cuff tears can occur through a variety of mechanisms. Um, they can be traumatic, where somebody falls onto an outstretched arm, um, but most of these tears are not traumatic. They can occur either by extrinsic causes or intrinsic causes. Extrinsic impingement, as we say, is a process by which the surrounding structures rub on the rotator cuff day after day, and the rotator cuff can fray and eventually tear. But the most common way that rotator cuff tears occur is what we call intrinsic degeneration. The tendon itself simply degenerates over time and rotator cuff tears can eventually occur spontaneously. Because most of these tears are degenerative, it tends to be an age-related phenomenon. As time goes by, the incidence of rotator cuff tears can increase. So that by the time we're 70 years old, we have at least a 40% chance of having a tear, even in the absence of trauma. We tend to classify these tears based on size, where a small tear can be less than a centimeter and a large tear can be three centimeters or more. But there are lots of other characteristics that are important in describing tears. Some of these characteristics are patient-related and some of these characteristics are tear-related. The patient-related characteristics that are important include age, because again, tears increase in incidence over time. There are certain comorbidities that make tears more uh, frequent, uh, as in the case with rheumatoid arthritis, for example. And there are certain comorbidities or other medical problems that can impact our ability to fix tears and get them to heal, for example, nicotine use. The mechanism of tears, how they occurred, and how long they've been present are also important. And then there are tear-related characteristics that are important as well. Of course, we've talked about size. But the degree of retraction or how far away the tendon has pulled from its attachment is important. And the health of the muscle bellies themselves is also important. When we fix rotator cuff tears, the themes are consistent. We're trying to reattach the tendon back down to its bony attachment. And we do so with a series of plastic anchors or small screws placed into the bone. These screws are absorbable over time and they have very strong thread attached to them. We pass this thread through the tissue with a series of instruments and the number of anchors we place and the manner in which we pass these stitches will depend on the specific characteristics of the tear. We then separate these stitches and we can fix them with an additional set of anchors alongside the attachment site, as you can see here. And this provides this crisscrossing matrix of stitches that compresses the tendon back down to the bone. So this is an example of a typical double row repair of a medium tear, for example. Now there are various things that can impact our ability to fix a tear in the first place. The truth is not all tears are fixable. And there are a variety of things that can determine whether it's fixable or not. 
First is the quality of the muscle. As tears exist for a prolonged period of time, the muscle itself, because it's not doing much work, undergoes chronic change. It can decrease in volume, a phenomenon called atrophy. And we also can see fatty stranding within the muscle, a process we call fatty degeneration. And if there's a significant amount of degeneration of the muscle, uh, the tear is less likely to be fixable. We also need to place those anchors into the bone and get rigid fixation of those anchors. They have to withstand force over time. And this can be negatively impacted by conditions like osteoporosis, or in the case of a patient who had a previous repair where there may already be some anchors present in the bone getting in our way. Thirdly, the tissue quality of the rotator cuff tendon itself has to be sufficient enough to retain the stitches that were passing through the tissue. If we pass stitches through significantly degenerated tissue and then they simply pull through when tension is applied, that negatively impacts our ability to fix the tendon. And finally, and most importantly, we need to be able to achieve a tension-free repair. We need to be able to pull the tendon back out to its attachment site and keep it there without undue tension. There are certain cases in chronic, very large tears where no matter how hard we try to mobilize the tissue and release scar tissue, we simply cannot pull the tendon out to the bony attachment and therefore a repair simply isn't possible. We try to predict this ahead of time. We don't necessarily want to be surprised at the time of surgery. And there are certain things we can use to predict whether a tear is going to be fixable. The first one is a patient who has chronic pseudoparalysis. We've talked about how the important job of the rotator cuff is to maintain a stable connection between ball and socket. In somebody who's had a tear for a very long time and the tear is very large, they lose this stable connection. And as the deltoid pulls, the ball slips up and out of the socket and they lose that fixed fulcrum. When they try to raise their arm, they simply shrug the shoulder instead. They cannot raise their arm in space. If they've had this pseudoparalysis for a long, long time, that's likely to be a tear that's not fixable. We can also look at the tendon on MRI, and if we find that there's a significant amount of degeneration and shortening of the tendon stump, or if it's significantly retracted away from its attachment site, again, that's unlikely to be fixable. And then again, we look at the muscle. And if there's significant atrophy, if the muscle is shrunken, or if there's a lot of fatty change in the muscle, that helps us predict whether or not that tear can be fixable. As you can see in this bottom panel, uh, you can see the scapula bone, which is shaped like a Y. And in each fossa, there should be a lean, healthy muscle belly. And in the top section of the Y and in the right section of the Y, you see that instead of lean gray-black muscle, there's simply a significant amount of fat. And that indicates a significant amount of muscle degeneration. Now turning to treatment, there are many options for the management of a tear that cannot be fixed. And I try to categorize them to simplify decision making. We have the options that can be done through limited arthroscopy, which may include simply cleaning up the tear or fixing only a portion of the tear. We also have reconstructive options where we can perform a tendon transfer or we can reconstruct the capsule of the joint. A special type of arthroplasty called a, a reverse replacement can actually be done in these cases as well. And then there's a novel solution that was recently introduced called a balloon interposition, which I'll describe later on. Debridement is the simplest treatment for an irreparable tear, where we are not trying to fix the tendon at all, we're simply cleaning up the joint. We're removing scar tissue, we are removing the inflamed bursal tissue, which can be painful. And in certain cases, we can release the biceps tendon, which does travel into the joint, can also be injured, and can be a pain generator in these patients. And in several series you know, throughout the decades, uh, positive outcomes have been reported in these patients with respect to pain relief primarily, even though the tear will persist and they'll still have a certain amount of weakness. Well, even though we can't fix each and every aspect of the tear, there are other patients where we might just fix a portion of the tear, the portion of the tendon that is in fact fixable. And these partial repairs, again, have been shown to improve pain and ultimate outcomes in certain patients. We have to be a little bit careful with, with certain patients, though, that may not do as well. If there's a patient with that pseudoparalysis who simply shrugs their shoulder and can't elevate the arm in space, or if there's a patient who already has some arthritis as a result of their cuff tear, those patients may not do as well with a partial repair. 
This is an example of a case of mine of a patient who has no arthritis, as you can see in the left panel, but the right panel demonstrates that he has an irreparable tear. The tendon is significantly degenerated beyond the socket uh, of the ball and socket joint. There's significant degeneration and shortening of the tendon stump, so it's clearly a non-repairable situation. This is an arthroscopic picture of his bald humeral head. The tendon is completely torn and retracted very far away from its attachment site, again, indicating that the whole thing cannot be fixed. But the back portion of the rotator cuff, the infraspinatus tendon, can be mobilized back out to its attachment site. So, in fact, he was able to get a partial repair of just that infraspinatus tendon. And his ultimate outcome demonstrates that he was able to regain a significant amount of his motion, and he was quite pleased with his result in terms of pain relief and overall function. So for this particular patient, a partial repair was the right option. There are more elaborate ways to treat a tear that cannot be fixed, and one of these is a tendon transfer. You take a tendon from one part of the body and move it over to a different part of the body, in this case where the rotator cuff should attach, in an effort to replace its function. In general, when we're looking for an appropriate tendon to transfer from one area to another area, we want to make sure it has the similar strength and power of the deficient muscle. We want to make sure that it's expendable, that we're not going to make the patient worse by taking this muscle away. And we also want to make sure that it's in phase, that it does more or less the same job as the deficient muscle, so there's not a lot of retraining that has to be done to get it to do the new job that we're asking it to perform. The standard of care for tendon transfer for an, a non-fixable tear was a latissimus transfer. This is one of the large muscles of the torso, and it's local to the shoulder, and it can simply be moved from where it normally attaches on the humerus to the attachment site of the rotator cuff. This uh, has been done for decades, and there's a track record in the literature that demonstrates good outcomes in certain patients. The patients that do well with a latissimus transfer are those, number one, that have an intact front rotator cuff muscle called the subscapularis, and those that have preserved elevation before surgery, so again, they shouldn't have that pseudoparalysis. And finally, and most importantly, they have to be able to retrain the latissimus. One of the primary weaknesses of the latissimus is that it's not in phase with the rotator cuff. The latissimus adducts towards the body and internally rotates whereas the rotator cuff abducts away from the body and externally rotates. So in order to get the latissimus to work, you have to retrain the brain, the nerves, and the muscle to do a completely different job. And if you're able to do this, the latissimus will work well. And if you're not able to do this, the latissimus won't work as well. And that's really where the lower trapezius transfer became more popular. This is a different muscle on the back of the torso. And this muscle is in phase with the rotator cuff, and that's its primary advantage. Uh, you can move this, uh, a portion of this muscle, the lower trapezius, from where it attaches to the rotator cuff with the help of an allograft cadaver graft extension and plug it into where the rotator cuff normally inserts, and you can get it to do similar work. And the good news is that most people have a functioning lower trap, even in the case of a massive cuff tear. It is expendable, at least the lower portion of it is, and as I mentioned, it is in phase. And so the recent reports that have looked at outcomes of this procedure have demonstrated improved pain and motion and improved overall function in these patients. So it can be a good option for our active patients. This is a case example of somebody who has an irreparable cuff tear, and you'll see some common themes. The left panel demonstrates loss of that stable connection. You can see the ball riding a little bit up and out of the joint. The right panel demonstrates significant atrophy of the rotator cuff. So this patient needs an operation and chose to proceed with a lower trap transfer. This is an example of the skin incision in the back of the shoulder where we harvest the, the muscle. The top right panel demonstrates what the muscle looks like when we isolate it and harvest it. And then we use this graft material to extend the muscle, because you can see it's relatively short, so that it can reach the normal attachment of the rotator cuff. And this is what the patient looks like when he is fully recovered from the procedure. He has regained significant elevation and external rotation and a certain amount of his external rotation strength. And the right panel, which is somewhat hard to see, demonstrates that when he tries to fire the rotator cuff, when he's asked to externally rotate, the lower trapezius contracts. So in fact, it's easy to retrain this muscle because it's in phase. And this patient was able to do well as a result. 
In contrast to tendon transfers, a different reconstruction can be performed for these patients. And instead of trying to replace the muscle, you're simply trying to reestablish the stable connection between ball and socket with a static graft. The procedure is done in a similar way. We place anchors on the socket side, and we place anchors on the ball side. And then we do some measurements and we prepare the graft on the back table and we retrieve these various stitches and pass them through the graft outside of the body. And then using those stitches as a pulley and using a grasper, we can deliver the graft into the joint and we can use these stitches to rigidly fix the graft to the socket and rigidly fix the graft to the ball and recreate that stable connection so that the patient can now have that fixed fulcrum that they need in order to move the arm in space with the other intact muscles. So the goal of this procedure is to provide a stable check rein to that proximal migration that can occur when the rotator cuff is absent. It has good biomechanics when looked at in the laboratory, and when looked at clinically in patients, it has demonstrated improved motion improved alignment on x-rays, and improved outcomes instruments scores. And the healing rates have been estimated at about 85% in certain reports. This is an example of a case, and again, some common themes. On the left panel, you see some proximal migration in a patient that has a chronic irreparable tear. This patient had previously undergone an operation already for rotator cuff repair, so a revision repair wasn't indicated. And you can see on the right panel that the muscle is significantly retracted away from the socket with a significantly shortened tendon stump. There really isn't anything to repair, so a reconstructive option was ideal. This is an arthroscopic picture of this patient where you see anchors already placed on the socket side and you see some measurements being done with a calibrated probe in preparation for placement of a graft. This second panel shows that the graft has been delivered into the joint and fixed to the socket. And then the third panel shows that the graft has now been fixed on the ball side, recreating that stable connection. And you can see on this early postoperative x-ray that the alignment uh, has been improved between ball and socket, that proximal migration has been uh, improved, uh, because that stable connection has been restored. There's another way to provide that stable connection, and it can actually be done with a replacement. We don't do regular replacements in the setting of a chronic irreparable cuff tear because a regular replacement has the same problem as the patient's own shoulder. It relies on a functional rot rotator cuff to create a stable connection so that they can move their arm in space. Instead, with a reverse replacement, we reverse the parts. We place the socket where the ball used to be, and the ball where the socket used to be, as you can see on the right side of this illustration. And this reverse design creates a semi-constrained implant that recreates that stable connection. It also places the deltoid on tension, and a stable connection with a deltoid on tension provides the stable hinge that the patient requires so that the deltoid can do the job of raising the arm in space. So it's actually quite a powerful operation where you can take a patient who might have had pseudoparalysis, a complete inability to raise the arm, and restore that patient's ability to raise the arm above shoulder level, which can profoundly impact their overall function. It's one of the few examples in orthopedics where we can take a metal and plastic prosthesis and use it to replace the function of a deficient soft tissue structure. Initially, the pure indications of a reverse replacement were in a patient who had not just an irreparable tear, but also arthritis, and it would allow you to tackle both components of the patient's problem. But as time has gone by, the indications have expanded, and we, we now frequently perform this procedure for patients that have an irreparable cuff tear, even in the absence of, of arthritis, and it has a very good track record in improving patients' outcomes in this situation. This is an example of a patient, again, with an irreparable tear, and you see, again, that common theme in the left panel of proximal migration, upward movement of the humeral head relative to the socket because of the lack of a stable connection. This patient underwent reverse arthroplasty. You can see on the top right panel how he has a complete inability to maintain his arm in space as a result of his tear, which significantly impacts his function. You can see now in the bottom panel after surgery, he can very easily move that shoulder uh, above uh, uh, his uh, shoulder level in order to perform activities of daily living. So an incredibly powerful operation in the right patient. 
We've talked about a lot of complicated solutions for a complicated problem, but I'll finish with perhaps the simplest solution, which is, has been recently introduced. It's an interposition balloon. It's called the in-space balloon. It's a biodegradable polymer, which we fill with saline, in essence, a, a saline-filled balloon. And we place it where the rotator cuff used to be, above the ball and below the roof of the joint, in order to address that, that upward movement of the ball before it has the opportunity to press against the roof, causing pain and dysfunction. Um, this balloon degrades over 12 months, but interestingly, the benefits of the operation seem to endure well beyond this period of time. And a recent review of several uh, uh, outcome studies has demonstrated that this procedure can improve patients' pain, it can improve their range of motion, actually to a certain degree improve their strength and uh, overall ability to perform activities of daily living. So an incredibly appealing operation, primarily based on the, its, uh, its ease uh, uh, and also its uh, uh, limited uh, risks. So in an effort to simplify decision making in these complex uh, uh, patients with this complicated problem, we try to understand our patient's activity level and their expectations. So in our less active, perhaps older patients with limited expectations, perhaps they'd be best treated with a simple approach, including debridement and partial repair. Instead, in our young, more active patients with uh, more significant expectations, they may be better treated with a reconstructive procedure, either a superior capsular reconstruction or a lower trapezius transfer. The reverse arthroplasty certainly has a role in these patients, primarily those that have a limited ability to raise the arm, and in those that have already developed some degree of arthritis. And the balloon interposition clearly has a role for these patients, again, given how easy it is to perform and its limited risk profile. Thank you very much for your time.